Hello, in a previous video, I covered what was called the argument, um, uh, cosmological argument, the argument from cause, uh, which is an argument for the existence of God that basically says, nothing comes from nothing, nothing ever could, therefore there must be a God. Now, um, this is part of my series of uh, philosophy videos uh, from a, at least one Christian perspective. And in this video, I want to talk about another argument for the existence of God, which is the argument from design. Uh, sometimes called the teleological argument. The idea here is that um, when you find a watch, for example, William Paley, uh, if I could get it to forward, William Paley in the 1700s suggested that if you find a watch, you know, you're walking down the sidewalk and you find a watch, um, your, your assumption is going to be that, that somebody lost it and that there was a watchmaker. Your assumption is not going to be, wow, look what happened. There must have been a windstorm, and it whipped the silicon together, you know, and it fried it just right to make the glass, and then there must have been some metal nearby, and it just, it all blew, and, and it even has the right time. You know, uh, you're not going to say that. Uh, you're going to say, oh, there must have been a watchmaker uh, who made this watch. And so William Paley's argument was basically that uh, in the same way there is too much order in the universe for this just to be here by chance. And he, of course, uh, used the eye, the eyeball, as an example of the great order uh, uh, of the universe and posited that uh, it's just in, in, uh, incomprehensible, unimaginable, uh, that the eyeball would have just happened to, you know, be here by chance. Now, of course, he existed, uh, he lived before evolution. And so that's one thing that we want to talk about uh, in this video, and, and whether whether those sorts of things um, have, have somewhat tanked uh, William Paley's argument uh, for the for the existence of God, I want to reiterate something I said in my first video on the argument from cause, the cosmological argument, and that is is that my goal in these videos is not to prove uh, the existence of God. Um, I do believe uh, that that uh, I, I have this perspective that. The existence of God is no doubt provable uh, from, from an omniscient standpoint. That is, that if I were omniscient, I feel quite confident that I could prove the existence of God. However, I, I don't know all things. That's what omniscience means, knowing all things. I don't know all things. I have a finite brain. Everybody watching this has a finite brain. There are limitations to the data you know. Uh, there are limitations to your thinking processes. As a Christian, I believe that the human mind is fallen, uh, which means that even when we have uh, a lot of data, uh, our minds are prone to put it together uh, in an incorrect way. And so, although I, I believe that you could prove the existence of God if you were an all-knowing being like God, I'm sure that God can prove his own existence, uh, I'm not sure that we on the human plane um, can ever prove God's existence by, by way of rational argument. I just don't think that we, uh, we know enough. Uh, now, I could be wrong on that. Um, so my point is not to prove the existence of God. My point is merely to point out that the existence of a, um, intelligence design, an intelligent designer, so to speak, makes sense. Now, I'm not espousing a particular intelligence design uh, theory here, by the way. Uh, intelligent design theory is a um, is a form of um, uh, argument, usually addressing things like evolution. And I'm I'm really trying to bracket the whole question of evolution uh, in this video. Um, I'm not in any way arguing that uh, evolution has to be false for this argument to work. I'm bypassing uh, this whole the whole that whole part uh, of the pushback, um, pretty much in this argument. So I think. Uh, prima facie, uh, in, in, a, in a kind of first glance kind of way, it makes sense to say, man, there's a lot of order in this universe. And so it makes sense to say, there must have been somebody who designed this puppy. Now, um, there is something uh, called the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, the second law of thermodynamics suggests that um, uh, the universe, uh, in, in the disorder, uh, the, the kind of net disorder in the universe is constantly increasing. There is a constant loss of energy as heat in the universe that is unrecoverable. 
uh, from a uh, from the standpoint of order um, that that even even black holes evaporate um, as Stephen Hawking uh, made uh, made his splash on the cosmological world um, and so th everything is moving toward disorder and so uh, if a if you find a shattered plate uh, on the ground um, you're not going to expect to come back in a few minutes and find that it's reassembled itself. Uh, you can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. That's the second law uh, of thermodynamics. And so um, there is a, a at first glance kind of common sense to the idea that wow, uh, as stupid as Ken is, uh, he's a pretty complex being. Um, surely there had to be some sort of a designer um, behind Ken. There are better instances of design than Ken, but, but uh, there must have been some intelligence uh, behind this sort of thing. Okay, well, that's the basic thrust of the, of the argument in terms of its kind of common sense form. Objections. Now, of course, David Hume in the 1700s also objected. He objected to the cosmological argument, uh, which we mentioned in our previous video, and he objected to the uh, teleological argument, the argument from purpose or design. So, for example, he suggested, how, how good of an analogy is this watch thing? Is it a good analogy? So, uh, I'm living, I have blood. Should I expect to find blood in trees? Um, uh, now, this is a kind of a strange argument because trees actually do have um, a kind of a flow of, of nutrients um, inside them that, that is at least on one level analogous to the flow of blood. So that's very interesting uh, that, that he would pick that particular uh, analogy to push back. Um, and of course, as usual, David Hume says, what kind of a God does this prove? Uh, it doesn't prove a benevolent God. Uh, in fact, uh, one might say that if you look at the evil and the injustice in the world, and we'll get to those the problem of evil in further videos, that, that perhaps the teleological argument suggests an, an evil <laughs> you know, kind of uh, creator God. Well, again, uh, I'm not arguing that uh, this argument uh, uh, proves the existence of a Trinitarian God, for example, or of a benevolent uh, God. That's not the argument uh, that I'm making. I'm simply, uh, this is simply one argument that makes some sense, I think, uh, and it is that there is a lot of order in the universe, and uh, it is, it blows our mind. Uh, to think how could it be so orderly uh, if there wasn't some intelligence uh, that has put it together. So if the, if the cosmological argument suggests that God as creator is all powerful because he had to have enough power to create all this stuff, um, the uh, teleological argument suggests that God is all knowing uh, or all intelligent. Um, and I'll come to that at the end of this, uh, this video. Well, I've already mentioned some of the objections that have been raised. Um, I think there are an awful lot of uh, thinkers in the 20th century uh, who believed that evolution had tanked uh, this uh, particular argument. Uh, and the idea of evolution is that um, um, even though the total randomness uh, of the universe is increasing, uh, that there can be pockets, uh, pockets of order. Um, such as when I clean the room, so um, if uh, which happens very seldom, by the way. But let's say that you walk into a room uh, that um, uh, you know for a fact yesterday was very messy, and that today it's very orderly, and you know say, "Whoa, this goes against the second law of thermodynamics." I've never heard anybody say that uh, because um, I can create a pocket of order uh, within. Um, within disorder. By the way, um, there are uh, evolutionary creationists, um, by which I mean um, Christians who believe that God used evolution to create, uh, who accept the evidence of, uh, of the fossil record and so forth in the, in the way that evolutionists interpret it, and yet would say that God gave just the right, you know, just the right zap at, at just the right points and just the right direction. Nope, go the other way. Um, for um, it to go in the way it did. And so, um, uh, so I'm basically what I'm arguing is, I, even if one were to accept evolution 
uh, it is not a um, a uh, a wholesale. Uh, it, it is it doesn't actually hurt this argument, as we'll see in the next slide. Um, chaos theory, of course. Chaos theory is the idea uh, that um, amidst uh, uh, massive amounts of randomness, uh, it is likely for some small pockets of order to happen. That that the even if even if the mathematical probability of a specific kind of order is is beyond um, possibility. Um, sometimes you'll hear somebody say, "Well, that's mathematically impossible." So even if uh, even if one particular outcome is mathematically impossible from one perspective, that some outcome is going to happen of order is very likely. A chaos theory would say it's kind of like take the lottery. The likelihood of you or I winning the lottery. It's outrageous. It's not at all likely at all. But the likelihood that someone will win the lottery is pretty likely. And so um, that's kind of what chaos theory might say with regard to this. So the, the, the likelihood of the specific order that exists on Earth is unlikely. But the likelihood that somewhere an order would develop um, is likely. That's what chaos theory would say. And of course, you have uh, the current, uh, probably the current favorite is the anthropic principle. The anthropic principle is the idea that um, even though it's very unlikely for us to be here, um, the fact that we're here uh, suggests that it happened. Um, uh, let me see if I can communicate this a little bit better than that. So it's kind of like chaos theory, that um, yes, it is incredibly unlikely uh, that we would be having a video conversation right now, but uh, it's likely that somebody would somewhere. And so the fact that we are here having it shows that we are the lucky ones um, and that there are lots and lots and lots of unlucky ones out there. So um, uh, I'm trying to remember who said it, um, but, but the idea that, um, that there may be a multiverse is very popular right now. Uh, this is the idea that this universe might be just the one that happened to work, that there might be all kinds of stillborn universes out there, uh, universes where the constants weren't right, universe, uh, universes where the laws of gravity weren't right. Um, and, and so there may be an infinite number of uh, unborn universes uh, that failed out there or where they immediately crunched back together. Um, but we just happen because we're because we're having this conversation. Obviously, we're in the one universe that worked. Um, that's the anthropic uh, principle. Well, um, let's push back on on those objections. So Richard Swinburne uh, was a PhD in physics and then became a PhD in theology in philosophy and theology uh, at Oxford, um, and um, he would uh, suggest that there are laws that govern evolution. And that there are laws that govern uh, gravity, cause effect. Um, someone might even argue that there's a moral structure to the universe. We'll talk about the moral argument for the existence of God in the next video. Uh, but but the, the idea that Swinburne in his pushback is making uh, is that uh, there are still laws to physics. You know, uh, I, I didn't wake up this morning wondering, oh, I hope gravity works. Should I get out of bed or not? You, you know, uh, I, I'm not expecting to walk out of this building, ah, you know, and go flying off into outer space. Um, I'm expecting the laws of gravity to um, to work. Um, you know, uh, cosmologists assume that the laws of physics work the same, you know, way out in Alpha Centauri uh, as they work here here on Earth. So why is it that the laws of gravity uh, and causality? Why are these things constant? There's an order to the universe. Even, even the second law of thermodynamics is a law. I mean, um, they don't, oh, well, we've got the new physics book rules. You know, the laws have changed again this year. And so you're going to have to learn a new uh, uh, Coulomb's law. You know, here's a new one. Uh, it doesn't happen like that. The laws of nature are the same from year in and year out. Why? Why, are there, why is there an orderliness to the laws of, of nature? I've been particularly enamored of late with something called the fine-tuning argument. And it completely bypasses the whole debate uh, over evolution. Um, and it suggests that the physical universe 
is is on a razor's edge, really, uh, and not, and a, a micro razor's edge. Uh, that if things were different in the laws of nature, by even just a smidge, we wouldn't be here. So, for example, uh, the fact that there are three dimensions uh, to to our normal space and not four. Um, the, the fact of three dimensions uh, gives us what's called the inverse square law uh, for gravity and for electromagnetism. So um, for gravity, as things are moved apart, uh, they, the gravity decreases according to the square of the, of the distance. If it, if it wasn't like that, planets couldn't orbit the sun. If it wasn't like that, electrons couldn't orbit the, um, uh, the nucleus. So why only three dimensions? Now, um, someone like uh, Hawking might say, well, uh, there may be another, uh, or uh, actually it was a, a book I read by Martin Rees, uh, Just Six Numbers. He's the one you know, that suggested there may be stillborn universes out there. Um, so is there a universe out there that had four dimensions and actually failed? How would that even work? Um, um, is, it, is it even possible for there to be a spontaneously generated universe with, with a different number of dimensions. Now, I, obviously, I don't know uh, how that would work. But, um, and, and by the way, William Paley in the 1700s knew this, um, that there is an orderliness to our three dimensions, that it just wouldn't work in more dimensions of normal space. Um, the arrow of time, why does time move forward? On a quantum level, time can move forward or backward. Uh, so why is it that time only moves in one direction? Um, now, I'm not saying that there couldn't be a universe uh, where God, uh, God went back and forth with people in time. You know, that you sin and then uh, when you repent, you, you unsin and then go forward again. I'm not, I mean, that'd be a fun novel. Um, but uh, the arrow of time implies a story to the universe. Um, the, and it has to do with, for example, the the amount of mass that's in the universe. It's not so much that it's gonna crunch eventually. It's, it's just, it's going out and out, which suggests that time has a beginning. Um, the, uh, the second law of thermodynamics uh, implies an arrow to time. And so there's a story, the story of salvation uh, is a story. And in order to have a story, you have to have an arrow of time. Uh, and so the, the arrow of time uh, is intrinsic to uh, the world as as we know it. There's a slight symmetry, asymmetry, I mean, between matter and antimatter. If the balance between matter and antimatter were per perfectly symmetrical, um, we wouldn't be here uh, because all the matter would annihilate with antimatter. Uh, but God created a slight favoritism. This is this is a this was a fascinating thing to me because I associate God with symmetry. I associate symmetry with beauty. And yet, if God hadn't created a slight imbalance uh, to the universe, we wouldn't be here. Um, there's a, something called the weak nuclear force. And uh, again, I don't have full understanding of these things, but to me, the weak nu nuclear force is God throwing just a little bit of a curveball uh, into the universe. And that little curveball uh, that is part of the universe is why we're here, um, because there's, there's a little preference for matter over antimatter uh, in the way God created uh, the universe. And if he didn't, we wouldn't be here. The balance of gravity and the total mass of the universe. Like I said, um, uh, uh, gravity, the universe is expanding. Um, if the mass of the, uh, the universe had been more, it, it would not have expanded in a way that would have allowed for the formation of suns and, and galaxies and so forth. Um, if, it had, if, if, if it had been a different ratio, it would have expanded so fast uh, that there would have been no time uh, that they would have just spread out. Uh, and so the balance between gravity and the mass of the universe is just right for universes to form and galaxies to form. Um, again, um, amazing, beautiful, wonderful things. The balance, balance of gravity and electromagnetism. Uh, so the gravitational force um, uh, is uh, fairly weak, but it builds. That's why a planet holds us down. But gravity doesn't interfere with electromagnetism. Uh, and, and so gravity doesn't mess up uh, the atom uh, because gravity is very small on an atomic level. Uh, but an electromagnetism works uh, and can make, uh, and the, the electrons can orbit as it were, it's a little more complicated than that, but the electrons can orbit 
a nucleus because gravity doesn't uh, mess it up. Uh, there's a something called the strong nuclear force. This is fascinating to me. Um, the, the God made the strong nuclear force to only work. It's very strong. It's the strongest of all the forces of nature. And, and in fact, it is probably behind uh, the expansion of, of the universe, uh, inflation of the universe at the very, very beginning of time. And yet God made the strong nuclear force to only work over a very, very small distance. And so the strong nuclear force is strong enough to hold protons uh, together. Uh, protons are positive. Uh, and if you know, like charges repel. So the protons in the nucleus should, should shoot apart uh, because of their like charge. But the strong nuclear force is strong enough to hold it uh, right there. In fact, it's just right um, to where a proton and a proton don't directly bond. But a proton, a neutron and a proton can, can bond. God created just the right mix of particles um, to make them come together in just the right order uh, in the early universe uh, so that nuclei uh, work the way they do. But the strong nuclear force only works at a small distance. And so it doesn't interfere with the electromagnetic force that holds the atom, electrons, and protons together. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. Um, it's on a razor's edge. Um, the formation of carbon. Um, carbon uh, hap uh, happens in, carbon is synthesized in stars. Again, this is all theory. But carbon is synthesized in stars when, when two smaller atoms fuse because the gravity of the star is so great, it crunches these molecules together. I'm trying to remember what the two are. I think it's, uh, it's beryllium and, and um, uh, one other, maybe helium. I'm not sure. But, but the, the, uh, there's a very narrow window for these two to, to lock together. And carbon, uh, there's something about the, the energy levels of carbon electrons, I think, uh, that it's just right, uh, or, the, or the energy levels of carbon are just right for these two to glue together in just the narrowest window of time uh, as fusion takes place in stars. Well, of course, if there was no carbon, there would be no human life forms, you know, and so the existence of us in our current life form is predicated upon the smallest window of gluing these things together. Of course, God could have done this by saying, poof, um, uh, but I'm, what I am arguing here is that even if you go with God using nat natural processes, the natural processes are finely tuned for these things all to work. It is so, it, it boggles the mind to imagine that this happened by chance. It just boggles the mind that all of these razor thin balanced things are here just by accident. It's, it's, it, 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 it's hard to even imagine that. The energy that's released when hydrogen fuses together into helium, this is essential to star making. Um, so uh, stars burn because hydrogen is fused together into helium and it gives off a certain amount of energy. Well, if it gave off uh, too much energy, uh, then we wouldn't have, uh, uh, the stars would burn out and we wouldn't have time to create carbon and, and have creatures like us. If it happened more slowly, um, then uh, uh, we wouldn't have uh, the, the universe either. Uh, and so there's just the right, uh, everything would just be, be hydrogen. And so just the right amount of, of uh, or everything would have become helium in the early universe if it happened um, uh, with less energy being uh, let off. And so there's just the right balance for suns to work. And if suns work, then people work. Uh, and so these are some of the scientific um, uh, discoveries of the last century, uh, some of them, uh, that suggest that um, we are really lucky to be here, uh, that if it had been a little different uh, on any of these scores, we wouldn't be here. Um, now, of course, God can do whatever God wants to, but I'm not arguing um, how, with how God wants to do things. I'm saying that even if you assume that things happen by natural processes, the odds of this happening. I mean, I can't even fathom a universe. I mean, can it, can it, can it, even in a multiverse, can a, can an alternate universe do anything different? How would it do it? There, 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 surely there's an underlying rule to how the multiverse works. And so this, as Aquinas would say, this we call God. Miracles. Miracles are, 
uh, and I want to kind of end with this this slide. Um, what about miracles and experiences of God? Now, these tend to be uh, either disputable or very personal. But um, here we're here we're beginning to move beyond the kind of purely uh, rational to the personal. Um, now, I had my I had a seminary professor who hated the, this song, but there's an old hymn that says. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. And I had a professor who hated that song. He says, we don't know because he lives in my heart. We know because of the testimony of the apostles. This is factual, not touchy-feely, uh, he would say. Nevertheless, I think the, the uh, people tend to believe in God because they've had experiences of God. Uh, I don't think people tend to come to God because of of logical argument, although there are the C.S. Lewis's and the Josh McDowell's out there. This, there are those who come kicking and screaming into the kingdom because they're rationally convinced uh, that it is logical and, and, and is the only reasonable conclusion. But probably uh, most people um, believe in God for personal uh, reasons, and, and, and especially those who've had experiences of God. And then there are things that, you know, miracles are debated. Do miracles take place? Um, there are certainly things that appear to be miracles out there. Um, a miracle, uh, there are different ways to define a miracle. I would define a miracle as something that is uh, inexplicable uh, given the laws of cause and effect. So some people define a miracle as something that's, uh, isn't this amazing? It's a miracle, but it's really not. It's just science or it's, or it's medicine or it's, it's, it was unlikely. You know, he had a 99% chance of dying and he lived. It's a miracle. Well, I'm fine with that ordinary language, but by my definition, that wouldn't be a miracle necessarily because there was a 1% chance uh, that, that he would live. So miracles for me are things that there's a 0% chance um, from a cause effect uh, standpoint. Walking on water, um, not going to happen. Um, now, Dead Sea, you can float <laughs> pretty easily, but, but uh if somebody can walk on the surface of an upright on the surface of water, there's a zero po possibility of that happening. Uh, it's a miracle. And so miracles are an example of order in the universe uh, that points to a, uh, a designer or, or a creator. And um, certainly there are a lot of people who believe uh, that they've experienced a, a miracle. Um, there are people who come back from the dead, <laughs> apparently, in, in uh, uh parts of the world. Um, I've, I've heard, I knew, I knew a fellow in seminary um, who, um, or in, in my doctoral program, uh, who believed that he'd seen someone come back from the dead in China. Uh, so now again, uh, if you haven't seen a miracle, probably they're not as convincing to you personally. But these are examples of order in the universe that point to an intelligent designer. Um, and we're getting a little bit closer to um, to the Christian God and the Trinity uh, here, uh, because now we're not just talking about, you know, the, sec the inverse square law of Newton, uh, but we're talking about uh, something that God does uh, in your life. Um, and I do want to mention the resurrection. Now, I, I don't think I can prove the resurrection of Christ, but I think that if resurrections happen, uh, this is definitely uh, one that I can make a good argument for. Uh, now, if you don't believe that resurrections can happen, obviously you're going to come up with some other explanation. But um, a good argument can be made that if resurrections happen, this was one. Um, and, and there's a two-prong argument uh, here, I would say. I think I took this uh, from Evidence for Jesus uh, by uh, James Dunn, I think is where I got this, this two-prong argument. The first of all, uh, there is the lack of a body. Now, again, this doesn't prove that Jesus was risen from the dead, but uh, nobody uh, has apparently ever produced the body uh, of Jesus. Now, we're not in the first century, so we can't go looking for it, really. Uh, but um, the earliest testimony of the Gospels is unanimous uh, in uh, there not being a body. Um, uh, the Gospel of Mark, the earliest account, uh, they get to the tomb and there's no body. Matthew, Luke, John, no body. Now, um, uh, yeah, obviously, we're so far away from the event uh, that, uh, we, like I said, we can't go, go around looking for it or interrogating uh, people about it. But I do want to point out that there is not a trace of 
of any argument over this in the New Testament. That is to say that, that as we look at um, kind of the effect of this event in the New Testament, there is no hint anywhere in any of the New Testament writings that anyone disputed the empty tomb. Um, now, it's an argument from silence, but in other words, you don't find Paul saying, now there are some who say uh, that his body was over, you know, two tombs over. You don't find Paul arguing against that. You don't find Matthew arguing against that, or Mark or Luke or John arguing against that. You don't find any arguments in the New Testament arguing against people who say they have found the body. The assumption is rather that the body is not found. In fact, in Matthew, remember, remember what uh, in Matthew 28, the, the guards are, are told, tell people that the disciples stole the body. So obviously the people uh, who are saying this probably don't believe in the resurrection. Uh, but what do they say? Um, they say the disciples stole the body. What does that assume? It assumes there's no body. What I'm getting at is even those, so the only evidence we have indicates that even those who didn't believe in the resurrection did not know where the body was. There was no body. Uh, and so um, uh, this is one prong of the argument that re the belief in resurrection is plausible because no one has ever been, no one has ever indicated that there is a body. Or, or and, and in fact, the evidence suggests that from a very early time, there was no body, and that those who didn't believe in the resurrection didn't know where the body was either. Um, by the way, the disciples um, died uh, pretty horrific deaths, it would seem. Uh, there's a song, it's a country gospel song, uh, that I'm not sure how accurate it is, uh, but I'll, I'm going to sing it just because I like it. Um, um, Andrew died upon a cross, we hear. Thomas killed in India with a spear. James the less was sawed into arrows through the body of Jude. Philip died by hanging without fear. Filleted alive by knife, Bartholomew. Martyred Simon, James the elder, writer Matthew. Simon Peter in Rome bound, crucified him upside down. Only John could live his whole life through. Well, again, I'm not sure that all of those uh, are correct in how the disciples died. But if the disciples did steal the body, I think I would have fessed up. Um, oh, okay, 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 I'll tell you where it is. You, you, you see what I'm saying? That, that um, the, the indications are um, that the individuals who believed in the empty tomb uh, were so convinced in the empty tomb that they eventually lost their lives, or many of them lost their lives, died a martyr's death. Um, I think it's pretty, pretty firmly established that Peter uh, was crucified in Rome in the 60s by Nero. I think it's fairly very likely that Paul was beheaded in Rome by Nero. Um, now, if these people weren't really convinced of the resurrection, um, I mean, I think there's a time to waver. <laughs> you know, well, maybe, maybe I was wrong, you know, that we have no evidence that anything like that happened. Rather, the evidence suggests that these people were very convinced. In fact, they went from, from being cowering, you know, cowering in the corner to boldly, you know, witnessing. Um, and facing persecution. So I think, you know, again, the evidence suggests that they were very convinced uh, that this had taken place. Now, the second prong then is the eyewitnesses. So we have no body, and we have people who are very convinced uh, that they have seen Jesus. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 mentions, um, first Jesus appeared to Peter, uh, and then he appeared to the other uh, 11, although Judas is gone, uh, maybe he means Matthias. Um, and then uh, he appeared to James, the Lord's brother. Here, here again, here's a guy who apparently wasn't that much of a, a Jesus follower while Jesus was actually with him. Um, James, the brother of Jesus, and then the other apostles, and lastly, Paul. I mean, look at the turnaround in Paul's life. These people were absolutely convinced that they had seen Jesus after uh, the resurrection, and they were willing to die, uh, uh, to die for it. Uh, and so um, we, have, we have nobody... And we have a whole lot of people on different occasions. Paul says over 500 people on one occasion who are convinced, and they're so convinced that they're willing to be persecuted and to die, and they have these massive turnarounds in their life. Uh, and so uh, all we need to do is have a little bit of faith, sprinkle just a little bit of faith on it, and we have a resurrection uh, here. Um, so again, if you don't believe in the possibility of resurrection, 
you're not going to believe this is a resurrection. Um, but I think, I think even if you're an atheist, you have to conclude that, that they were really convinced uh, that Jesus had risen from the dead. And so with just a little bit of faith, uh, it, it's reasonable uh, to believe that, in fact, Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, as I close out this video, the relevant attribute here is omniscience. Uh, if, if, uh, for the, from the cosmological argument, God had to have enough power to create the universe. So he must be all powerful with regard to the universe. Well, if God is creating the universe out of nothing, as Christians believe, then he, he doesn't just happen to get lucky in the kitchen. So I might get lucky in the kitchen. You know, I might take a bunch of stuff out of the freezer, you know, and eggs and uh, hopefully don't have eggs in the freezer. But, you know, I could, take, I could take some food out of the fridge and throw it on the wall and take a blowtorch, you know, and peel it off and say, mmm, tastes like chicken. You know, uh, it could turn out okay. Um, but that's not what we're saying when we say that God created the universe out of nothing. Now, I'm assuming, now I'm, I'm going to a faith perspective now, and I'm going to assume that God created the universe out of nothing. It's not even, we're not even saying that emptiness was there and God put stuff in it. We're saying that God even created the emptiness. We're saying that God created the rules. All those things that I was talking about, God invented the very rules. There are implications for this. The implications are that God knows how this universe works thoroughly and completely. This means that there are all kinds of popular things uh, that even Christians say that don't follow. So, for example, the idea that God had had to become human to, to learn something. No, God doesn't learn anything. God created the possibility of everything. God created the possibility of evil. If we believe that God is God, then we must believe that God knows what it's like to do evil. That simply follows. Um, and I know that's a shocking thought, but if God is omniscient, it's the case. There's no argument here. It is the case. There's no difference between experiential knowledge and a head knowledge when it comes to God. Um, God knows all things, uh, including what experiences uh, are like. Um, and so um, I, of course, not only believe that God knows all the possibilities of the universe, I believe that God knows all the actualities of the universe, that he not only knows all the possible worlds, but he knows exactly what's going to unfold uh, in this universe. Uh, now, I've gone beyond kind of the argument for the existence of God to uh, certain faith assumptions. Uh, that is, and, and what I'm telling you now is, is completely orthodox, historic Christian belief. Well, thank you very much. This has been the argument from the, exist, from the uh, design, the teleological argument. It does not prove, I don't think, uh, the existence of God, certainly not the existence of a loving creator God, but it, it makes sense. Man, how could all those things just be? Um, surely there must have been a really, really intelligent designer uh, behind this universe.